they call him the Datuk. That means effectively he's a knight of Malaysia. He is, to us, Peter Brokenshire, the general manager of the Peter Kuala is fine. Peter <laughs> is fine. Uh, general manager of the Kuala Lumpur Convention Centre and also the recent winner of the ICA Best PR Award. Congratulations yes, on that. Thanks, James. We're del absolutely delighted. Yeah, you've got a great team behind you. Uh, Certainly have. Kazima Idris, our public relations manager, she never misses an opportunity. <laughs> certainly not. Well, she certainly bagged that uh, inaugural prize. Well done. Now, um, let's get down to the harder nuts and bolts of, uh, of the business. The Kuala Lumpur Convention Centre opened in 2005 and it's, it's had a pretty meteoric rise on the Asian stage. It's, it strikes me that the, the stars have aligned both in terms of a national strategy but also the fact that it's, it's definitely Asia's time in the association sector. James, I think all of those things. When, uh, when I joined the centre in uh, 2003, uh, we, we basically started from a zero base. Uh, there was no bureau uh, and, and I think the economic downturn has created opportunities for us. It, it is Asia's century uh, and I think the, the fact that the, the, uh, the government through the economic transformation program has recognised and is supporting financially the, the business tourism industry is, uh, is a wonderful thing for us. Ha having all of the aces, you know, a degree of subvention available for you to make you as competitive as possible, ha has still has to be married with good operational facilities and also with great um, support from local potential host and national associations. Well, we, we have uh, what has to be one of the best locations in the world at the foot of the, the iconic Petronas Twin Towers. Uh, we have a building which was, was very intelligently designed and well thought through. We have owners who are very supportive. Uh, we have a very loyal team uh, and, and a very stable team. But also the, the local associations are, are interested and, and actively want to go after hosting both the regional and the, the international events. Those international events include from North America. and I, I see you on the circuit. Yes. particularly on the other side of the pond. Well, you know, the, the United States is interesting. I think with the advent of, of uh, trade shows in, in the US market, that what that has done, uh, coupled with the, the 2008 economic downturn, has uh, caused the, the American associations to focus more outwardly than they had previously. Uh, and that works to our advantage because we provide a, a wonderful opportunity in terms of new membership uh, and we provide uh, destinations and facilities which uh, fit the bill. The, uh, out of those American associations, are they, are they particularly specific to any sector? Are we talking about the medical sector, for example? Or? Well, for, for us, medical is very good. There's a lot, number of very active medical associations in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, oil is important to us, palm oil. Uh, gas is important to us, so you know all of those areas. But the medical area is particularly important for us. The more I talk to GMOs or, or anybody that's involved with a strategic plan, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing this identification of key economic clusters within which they want to target these international communities, not least because of the investment potential that come with them. Yes, and 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 that does does happen. But I think with the medical uh, conferences, what it is, it's the opportunity to interact with peers in that particular medical discipline. Uh, and certainly the, the associations and the government see the, the opportunity there. And that's why the Ministry for Health, for example, will, will host anything up to 100 local and regional participants because they want that interaction and development to take place. Do you have the degree of restriction in both in terms of compliance by the equivalent of UCOMED, for example, over here in Europe, in Asia, and also do you have legislation such as the Sunshine Act or the Anti-Bribery Act in the UK in Asia? Well, I, I think that the, the, the Pharma Code generally is, is, is uh, becoming worldwide, uh, and most countries have signed up to a voluntary code uh, where, there isn't a, uh, where it isn't legislated. Uh, and, and we're seeing this, but um, I, I think from a recent briefing that what, what everybody is doing is being more intelligent about it. They're, they're thinking outside the box uh, and looking at ways in which they can, they can get the, the support they want. But, you know, the, the fact that uh, really uh, there are, uh, 
maximums they can spend on on certain areas. This is the pharmaceutical companies, but it's more disclosure, and I think the fact that there is open disclosure now is good for everybody. Yeah, well, the only concern, well, I was at this session uh, earlier on, they were talking about just this subject, and, and they are mirroring the, uh, the Pharma Code and the uh, Sunshine Act in, in both instances, was that the HCPs are having to actually disclose on their income tax returns um, the delegate fee associated with being sponsored by a, by a farmer. Yeah, but you know, I, I think welcome to the real world <laughs> is, is what you have to say because uh, you know they, they they have been protected for a number of years, uh, and uh, and I think that you know it's 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 just part of the evolution of things. Yeah, great. Well, listen, Peter, we could talk for hours, but we're not allowed to. It's lovely meeting you uh, after James, such a great a win in uh, Shanghai. Congratulations again to your team on that, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thank Look you. forward to that. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Peter.